Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on inflammation and angiogenesis. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the calocrine kinin system and its involvement in the acute inflammatory response. Okay, so what we're firstly going to look at is uh, the acute inflammatory response and then uh, what we'll do is we'll try and look at the uh, calocrine kinin system and how it integrates into uh, the inflammatory response because in order to initiate the calocrine kinin system you need to bring in the components of the calocrine kinin system which are mainly in the blood okay so you need to form an inflammatory exudate and therefore uh, it's not the first thing that you set off in the inflammatory response it's one of the secondary things which leads to a positive feedback as we'll see okay so let's start off uh, with the more core inflammatory response. So how is the inflammatory response initiated? And then once we've built up an inflammatory exudate, we'll then be able to see how the calocrine kinin system is going to uh, work and how it's then going to lead to a positive feedback of uh, the acute inflammatory response. Okay, right. So let's start with some pathogens. So here is our pathogen. Now this could be um, some bacteria, it could be a fungus, uh, it could be uh, a virus, or potentially even um, some sort of parasite. Okay, so I will just call it a microbe, and a pathogen is just any, uh, well, it's anything which can cause disease. Okay, so here's our pathogen or our microbe or whatever, and let's say it's in a portion of our tissue. Now we don't want that, okay, so we're going to initiate uh, the acute inflammatory response to try and get rid of it. Okay, so what happens in the acute inflammatory response? Well basically in all of your tissues in the body, you have a bunch of cells which are known as sentinel cells, okay, and these cells are, uh, their job is to sit and wait for pathogens to arrive basically and uh, they're guard cells effectively they're sitting watching and waiting and if a pathogen does arrive in your tissue they're going to trigger the acute inflammatory response because what you have to understand is all of the forces all of your troops which are going to be able to attack the microbe pretty much all of them are within the blood Okay, so you don't have the troops that are needed to destroy this microbe just sitting around in your tissue waiting. Instead, you have a few tiny little guard cells um, which can attack the microbe, but really their job is to um, send a signal to the, um, to the blood cells, to the endothelial cells that tell the endothelial cells uh, in the local blood vessels to now start recruiting in troops from the blood to come and back up the sentinel cells okay, in this war against this microbe. Mm. Okay, so what are the different types of sentinel cells that we have in the human body? Well, um, we have firstly dendritic cells and these have absolutely nothing to do with neurons, even though they do look slightly like the um, cell body and the dendrites of a neuron. Okay, but it's just a cell with dendrites, basically. So it's not an excitable cell. It certainly is not capable of conducting action potentials because it won't have the voltage-gated channels that are needed in order to generate action potentials. Okay, so this is a dendritic cell here. Okay, so these are phagocytes which are capable of engulfing uh, the microbe. Uh, so they can uh, destroy the microbe themselves, but they're going to be part of this, um, this um, guard system where they're going to send signals to the local blood vessels to tell the local blood vessels to start recruiting troops. So their real role is in um, triggering the acute inflammatory response. You also have resident macrophages, so let's put these here. So a great big blob of a cell here. So this is a resident macrophage. So all over your body, uh, in all of your tissues, you will have some resident macrophages. Okay, and these are also sentinel cells that are standing, watching, and waiting. Okay, and the final type of sentinel cell I'm going to talk about is what's known as a mast cell. So here is a mast cell. Okay, and mast cells are how full 
are full of um, vesicles, okay, or granules as they're often called. So little uh, vesicles, membrane bound um, structures within the cytoplasm. And these vesicles or granules as they're called are full of uh, histamine, okay. All right, so these are our three types of sentinel cell, and basically they are, their role is to detect pathogens and send signals that uh, signal that the acute inflammatory response needs to start, basically. They send signals to the endothelial cells of the local blood vessels, okay, that uh, we need to uh, begin recruiting uh, troops into this site to fight this pathogen, basically. Okay, so uh, let's look at how uh, do these sentinel cells actually detect uh, the presence of the pathogen. Okay, so what they have is a number of receptors, okay, which are known as pattern recognition receptors. So let me write this down. Okay, so these sentinel cells have a number of receptors which are called pattern um, recognition receptors. Okay, and for short, these are often denoted as PRRs. Okay, and what are these pattern recognition receptors receptive to? I.e., what is their ligand? Well, their ligand, um, well, their ligands are not set. They all have different ligands, basically, and their ligands are all molecules that are associated with pathogens, basically, that normal human cells would never have. Okay, so if you think about this, our bodies are just masses and masses of cells, 100 trillion cells or somewhere around there. Okay, how are these cells going to tell that this cell is different from all the rest? Okay, well it has to be that this cell has something, maybe on its surface or maybe it's secreting something, that the normal human cells would never, ever, ever have on their surface or be secreting, okay, and molecules uh, that human cells would never ever have but pathogenic cells can have are collectively known as pathogen associated molecular patterns, okay, um, pathogen associated molecular patterns, and because pathogen associated molecular patterns is a bit of a mouthful, people often just abbreviate it to PAMPs for short, so P from pathogen, A from associated, M from molecular, P from patterns, and then also an S from the end of patterns here, and we get PAMPs, PAMPs. Okay, so the pathogen will have all sorts of molecules that normal human cells would never have, and these collectively are known as PAMPs. Now, PAMPs are going to have pattern recognition receptors, i.e. receptors on these sentinel cells, which will bind to them. Okay, so let's put a drawing to make it simpler. Okay, so here is our pattern recognition receptor on the surface of the dendritic cell here. Okay, and this microbe maybe is secreting some form of PAMP that normal human cells would never ever secrete, so it's a giveaway sign that there is something wrong here. Okay, now what this will cause is when the pattern, sorry, when the pathogen associated molecular pattern activates the pattern recognition receptor by binding to it, then that will cause the activation of these free cell types, so these dendritic cells, these resident macrophages, and these mast cells, these free types of sentinel cells. And they are now going to start secreting signals, okay? Signals which are going to go to the blood vessels within this tissue which is infected, and they're going to activate the endothelial cells of those blood vessels. So what are these signals? Well, dendritic cells and macrophages, they start releasing two pro-inflammatory cytokines, okay, by the name of interleukin-1 and also tumor necrosis factor alpha, or TNF-alpha for short. So let me write their names out in full because these are very important molecules, so they, they deserve their names writing out in full at least once. So IL-1 is short for interleukin-1, and sometimes you'll see people put a dash in between the interleukin and 1, sometimes you'll people will just write IL with no dash and then 1 straight away afterwards. It's obviously trivial. Okay, so, and then this other one, TNF-alpha, is tumor 
necrosis factor alpha, and of course this is the um, British English spelling of tumor. If you're an, an American, get rid of that U, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm British, so I have just been brought up with that one, and I don't like the other one. So tumor necrosis factor alpha. Okay, now also let's talk about tumor necrosis factor alpha because often you will hear people just refer to tumor necrosis factor alpha as tumor necrosis factor or TNF. So there are different tumor necrosis factors. There is a tumor necrosis factor beta most definitely, I know about that one. Uh, and there is a tumor necrosis factor C as well. Um, but um, they're kind of much more niche uh, they're sort of more specialist knowledge, whereas tumor necrosis factor alpha, I don't think you can get a medical degree without knowing what tumor necrosis factor alpha is. It's very, very important in the acute inflammatory response. It's easily the most important of the tumor necrosis factors. So um, that's why if people talk about tumor necrosis factor and they don't clarify at the end by putting a uh, additional symbol, then you can assume that they mean tumor necrosis factor alpha because it's it's the main one. And that's a general principle, you know. Um, if people are talking about uh, a whole family of molecules and they don't specify which of those families, which, sorry, which of the family members they mean, then it will usually be the case that there is a most important member and all the others are kind of niche uh, and they'll be meaning that one. Okay, so uh, that's what the dendritic cells and the resident macrophages start releasing. Now, when the mast cells are activated by PAMPs uh, binding to their pattern recognition receptors, what will happen is uh, they will start exocytosing these granules which are full of histamine. So they will start releasing histamine. Okay. Uh, now, histamine is a very small molecule. It's based on the amino acid histidine. You basically just remove the carboxylic acid group of uh, the amino acid histidine. In fact, why don't we even draw its structure out? So here's the amino group, okay, as though it's an amino acid. And then here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it. Now you would, if we were drawing the amino acid histidine, you would have a carboxylic acid group down here. but we're talking about histamine, so you've replaced the carboxylic acid group with an hydrogen. And then it's just the normal R group of histidine. Okay, so you have these two carbons here, and you have what's known as an imidazole ring. So this is a five-membered ring here. Okay, and you have a double bond between this nitrogen and this carbon down here, and that's an imide bond. So when you have a double bond between carbon and nitrogen atoms, uh, that's what's known as an imide bond, and that's why this ring is known as an imidazole ring. So this is an imide bond. Okay, and the whole ring, as I said, is called um, an imidazole ring. Okay, so imide is for this imide bond. Dazole. Basically, when you talk about uh, zol uh, or azo, azo generally means pertaining to nitrogen. So dazol kind of means that um, you've got two nitrogens. It's kind of got diazole there, shortened for diazole. Uh, so it's kind of meaning that you've got two nitrogens there. So that's the basis of the name for this ring. You've also got a double bond down there. Okay, and then you've got a hydrogen off here hydrogen off here, and also a hydrogen of that carbon there. So this ring here, so let me highlight it up, okay, this ring is what's known as the imidazole ring, and it's uh, a quite common aromatic ring, okay. So the pure imidazole ring would obviously not have this lump sticking off the end, instead it would just have a hydrogen sticking off that carbon. Okay, so uh, this is the structure of the small molecule histamine. Uh, and the reason I want to emphasize that it's a small molecule is that it's different from interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, which are big peptide molecules. Okay, so it's much smaller than them. Okay, right. So both, of, well, all three of these molecules are going to go to the endothelial cells of the local blood vessels, and they're going to trigger uh, the activation of those endothelial cells which will drive the acute inflammatory response. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.